I'm excited to be with you again this morning. Um, this actually is kind of a, it's interesting that I'm here today um, starting a new thing for both this service and 1107. Um, several months ago, we started meeting uh, a group of us to talk about um, what we wanted the direction of these services to be. And um, in, in doing that, Reverend Temple and Reverend Kate had decided that maybe this is this space, in this room, we wouldn't necessarily have to follow the lectionary and we wouldn't necessarily do that. Um, so we started talking about what would we do. Um, and so as we start today looking towards Advent, looking towards Christmas and Christ's coming, we wanted to start way back in Matthew chapter 1. There's a genealogy of Jesus and it walks through from Abraham all the way down to Jesus' birth. So we thought, how cool would it be as we approach Jesus' birth to really kind of go back and start and look at those people along the way that laid the foundation for Christ's birth and for Christ's arrival into our, our realm. So, um, this morning is the first morning of that. It's our new series, we call it Bloodline, um, the family lineage of Jesus Christ. So today, I get the privilege of talking to you about the father of the Hebrews, Abraham himself. And I remember being a kid in church, learning about Abraham through this ridiculous song with all these motions, um, where you stick your tongue out and you spin around and you sit down. And all I knew was that Abraham was a father and that he had many sons. And many sons had father Abraham. Um, so, but, as I've grown and as I've been in the church and, and kind of just spent some time studying Abraham, he's really interesting figure and has a lot I think that as he is the start of this lineage as he is the start of the Hebrew people he really parallels greatly Christ's coming and Christ's life so this morning we're going to spend some time looking at Abraham but before we do that I want to go um, to a discussion that Jesus had with, his, with um, some of the Jews in the book of John before I get to the before I get to the verses, um, a chapter earlier than what we're going to read, Jesus is is having this um, we'll say argument with with some Jewish leaders about Abraham. He's ta they're talking about their Ab their Abrahamic lineage, and we are sons of Abraham, and we are the Hebrew people, God's chosen. And Jesus tells the Jews that um, if they do what he says, he being Jesus, if you do what I say, what I teach, the truth will set you free. Of course, they come back and they go, well, we're sons of Abraham. We, we're not slaves to anybody. We've never been slaves to anybody. And Jesus says, you are slaves. You're slaves to sin. And he said, I don't know about, I don't know about you, but um, I have a... I have a picture of my, my father, um, and I think I brought it to staff meeting one day, and David fell his lap because he thought, there's no way that's not you. Um, I look just like my dad. Um, and, I, and I always tell the students, you know, I, I had a, my parents got divorced when I was really young, and I grew up with my stepdad being my father. I look a lot like my biological dad, physically. I don't act much like him. I act probably just like my stepdad who's raised me and grown me and so there's there's two components there one looking like on the outside and looking like on the inside and so the Jews are saying hey we're Abraham's sons we are the lineage we look like him outside we are the Jewish people but Jesus says yeah but you don't really look like him on the inside because if you were Abraham's sons if you were children of Abraham children of of Israel, then you would do the things that he did. You would behave the way he behaved. And I think that's what we all want for the next generation, is for our kids to to grow up and, and be like us and maybe better than us and not make some of the same mistakes we did. So we pour into them and we try to protect them to a certain extent and try to keep them from doing maybe some stupid things we did. And part of my job as a youth pastor is that I want to help students to be the best they can and to look like their father and to look like their father, right? 
both physically and relationally. But Jesus tells the Jews, you don't look like him because you don't act like him. See, the Jews were trying to kill Jesus. And he said, Abraham would have never gone against someone bringing God's word and God's truth and God's prophecy. Which then leads into our next passage, John chapter 8, starting in verse 51. If you practice what I'm telling you, you'll never have to look death in the face. At this point, the Jews said, now we know you're crazy. Abraham died, the prophets died, and you so you show up saying, if you practice what I'm telling you, you'll never have to face death, not even a taste. Are you greater than Abraham who died, and the prophets who died? Who do you think you are? He continues on. Jesus said, if I turn the spotlight on myself, it wouldn't amount to anything. But my father, the same one you say is your father, put me here at this time and place of splendor. You haven't recognized him in this, but I have. If I am false modesty say I didn't know what was going on, I would be as much of a liar as you are. But I do know, and I'm doing what he says. Abraham, your father, with jubilant faith, looked down the corridors of history and saw my day coming. He saw it, and he cheered. One more. The Jews said, you are not even 50 years old, and Abraham saw you? Believe me, Jesus said, I am who I am long before Abraham was anything. Abraham rejoiced at Jesus' coming. Because he looked down and saw my day approaching, and he rejoiced. And the Jews said, well, how, how did Abraham see Jesus? It seems kind of strange. How did Abraham see Jesus? So, um, that's where we get to our, our scripture for today. We're going to maybe look at an encounter between Jesus and Abraham. How many of you knew that Jesus and Abraham ever met? Okay, we're going to look at that this morning. Genesis chapter 17. And God said to Abraham, As for you, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? This is important before we get to this, this passage for today. Abraham laughed at God's promise. He laughed. Now into today's passage in the next chapter, chapter 18. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and bowed himself to the earth and said, O oh Lord, I have found favor in your sight. Do not pass by your servant. Three men showed up, and Abraham's immediate reaction is, This is the Lord. He recognizes the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Could you, or could I, recognize the Lord if He showed up? Could we? We talked about the staff name this week of a guy who was sent to us by another church who just was hurting and needed some help. And another church turned him away and said, Hey, those crazy Methodists, they'll take you. Right? And Jerry Hill said, Jesus, some other church sent Jesus to us. Sometimes a recognition, a recognition of the Lord is the, the first and foremost and most important thing, and it's not always easy to, to see. It's not always easy to recognize. God, these three men showed up, and, and Abraham refers to them as Lord. So God as man showed up to Abraham. God as man is who? Jesus. Right? That's what we meant. So, here all these years before Jesus is coming and Jesus' is birth, Jesus and Abraham had this encounter. 
and Jesus would continue to have encounters with people through his life, through his afterlife, through his risen, and continues to have encounters with us today in the form of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes in the form of hurting people. Continuing on in the passage. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest, your she- rest yourselves under the tree while I bring morsels of bread that may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. I think it's interesting that the Lord shows up long before Jesus' birth. Jesus shows up to Abraham. Jesus comes in Abraham says, we're going to wash your feet. We're going to give you bread. This is the first encounter of Holy Communion, right? Because what happened on that night when Jesus was with his disciples? He washed their feet. He gave them bread. And on Communion Sunday, World Communion Sunday, as we're looking back at Abraham, and God's encounter with Abraham, says, I want to wash your feet. I want to give you bread. It's kind of a reverse role. It's the first communion between God and man that we see. Moving on, chapter, or verse 6. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, Quit these three sayas of fine flour. Knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? And he said, She is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. This is the second time he's told Abraham this. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advancing in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. No need to spell that out. (laughs) So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you about this time next year. And Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh. She was afraid. He said, no. But you did laugh. <laughs> laughing in the tent. Sarah's laughing in the tent. Let me ask this. Are God's promises a joke? God's promises to you and to me a joke. Are they laughable and unbelievable sometimes? Probably. Sometimes it's hard to listen to God's promise. It's hard to trust Him fully and completely. But they're not a joke. Right on the rock. He has said it, therefore it shall be done. Now this this passage we read today, this is our vocal passage of Scripture, but those of you that heard me preach a couple months ago now, I don't I don't ever like to just pick one passage and stick to uh, to zoom to a lot. This is just part of God's covenant with Abraham. He's setting up this old covenant, right? He's starting this with Abraham. Abraham, the father of the Hebrews, I'm going to make you the father of all nations. I'm going to give you this child, and through that child will be my chosen people. This is just part one. Let's go back and look at some of the other stuff that God has promised Abraham as part of this covenant. Starting in Genesis chapter 13, several chapters earlier. The Lord said to Abraham, After Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from this place where you are, northward and southward, and eastward and westward, for all the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. God says, God takes Abraham up on a rock and says, Look around, everything you see is yours. So when I was reading that verse, made me think of one thing. One of my favorite movies of all time. Which is I have a picture. Fine. Right? And this is, uh, I have done this with our puppy several times. 
And I imagine when I have a child, I would do the same thing, just because it's, it's a part of who I am. I love it. But in The Lion King, Mufasa takes Simba up on a rock and says, Everything the light touches, that's our kingdom. And that's yours. And God is doing that to Abraham. Everything you see, I will give to you as part of my covenant to you. And then the next part of the covenant, in, in uh, chapter 15, and after these things, after these these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. In a vision. Fear not, Abram, I'm your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, but your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven, and number the stars. If you are able to number them, then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Now, as I was growing up, you know, I think you know about, you grow up and you kind of learn about, Oh, somebody's will, and they will do this, and your parents die, and they leave everything with kids. I guess I never really thought about, you know, what happens when you don't have kids? Then I, mean, I guess you just pick somebody else. Um, and so I don't have a point of reference of like, oh, well, I don't really want this person to get it, but by law, they're going to get it. Until my wife was like, bugging the heck out of me before we got married about watching this show. So as a wedding gift, I bought her three seasons of a show that we've been watching together, which is Down Abbey. Um, and, I'm, and before I say, before I go any further, let me just say, we have just finished season two. So don't be coming and talking to me about Down Abbey season three. Did not finish it yet. Don't spoil anything. Anyway, in Down Abbey, at the very start of it, uh, Lord Grantham and his wife have three daughters, and none of them are going to get to to run Down Abbey. They're not going to get that inheritance because they're they're female, and at that time that just wasn't allowed. So this person that's part of their family household that they don't really know is like a cousin is going to inherit this thing. So they're trying to marry off one of their daughters to this guy going, hey, let's keep in the family, you know? But that, to me, is, is kind of a similar situation to what's happening. Abram's saying, hey, look, I'm going to have to give all of this stuff that you're promising me to someone that I don't even know, someone that's part of my household, not my own flesh and blood. God says, hold on, hold on. And, and he gets to the part that we read earlier of, I'm going to give you a son, even though you're really old, and that's going to be how I populate this generation of my people. And then several chapters after we read God promising Sarah and Abraham a son, they get that son. That son is named Isaac. They finally got this thing, this incredible miracle. God made them this promise. They both laughed at it, but God came through and had the son. And the son starts to grow up, and almost immediately God does something awful strange in verse in chapter 22 of Genesis. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, Here I am. To take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell him. Now, let me just set this up for you, because I was talking about this to some of our students earlier. Imagine, imagine like Christmas morning, you've been dying for this certain thing, right? You've been wanting this certain thing, and you wind up getting it. Okay, you beg. In the bag, you left hints around the house and taped it on the mirror and sent text messages, and you finally get it. Your reaction, if you're anything like me, looks probably something like this. Right? Yes! Awesome! Finally got it. Now, imagine you have this massive iPad, and, and you get to take it out and set it up and put all your emails in it and start to play around with it for about two or three hours. And then the person who gave that to you says, okay, now what I'd like you to do is um, take that out in the driveway, wedge it under your tire, and then back over it a couple times. Uh, what? What would that feeling be like? 
That's essentially what's happening with God and Abraham. He said, you've been wanting this thing for so long, and I've finally given it to you. Now go kill it. Now go kill it. I don't know uh, about you, but I have a hard time with that. So let's see what Abraham's reaction is. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come to you again. And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he, set, and, and he took it in his hand and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, And my father, and he said, Here I am, my son. But behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And this is the part I want you to pay attention to. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is that Abraham's immediate reaction after being told, hey, this thing you want to go kill it, is, okay. Okay. I laughed at you the first time you told me something, and you came through. And so this time, I'm, I'm buying it. Because I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to trust you. Because it worked out the first time. I'm going to trust you. And then I think it's interesting what Abraham says when... Isaac asks him, where's the lamb? He says, God will provide for himself. God will provide for himself a lamb for the offering. I just, I, I don't know. It just, it's, a, it's an interesting phrase. As opposed to saying, God will provide the lamb for the offering. God will provide for himself. And I think it just shows that Abraham had the perspective that God... God's glory is so much more important than what I want or what I think is best for me. God knows what's up. And God knows ultimately what the best plan is. So I'm going to trust Him. And he will provide for Himself the link if it's Isaac or if it's something else. He'll take care. Let's finish that chapter. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. See, you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his wings. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. And it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand of the seashore, and your offshore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And this is the important part. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed with my voice. That last phrase, in your line shall the nations of the Lord be blessed. That is God's promise to Abraham, saying, that Messiah that I promised y'all, it's coming from you. It's coming from your line. Because you have not withheld anything. What is it that you hold back from God. What is it? Or what, what things are there? Because if you're anything like me, it's multiple things, right? 
to be my time, to be my money, to be my talents, to be my everything. We're about to start something with our teenagers talking about fasting and, and shedding off areas of excess. It's going to be hard. And we're going to do it for seven weeks, and my wife and I are praying about doing it for seven months. And I'm really, really scared of that. But God says, if you will obey me, I'll truly bless you. God continued his covenant through the next several generations with the Jews. With Moses, he had the Ten Commandments. He had the Pentateuch, which is a really fancy religious word for the five, first five books of the Bible. That's all called the law. That's the covenant. The old covenant. Another word for covenant would be testament. As in last will and testament. So we have the Old Testament and we have the New Testament. The last will and testament is only fulfilled in the death of he who made it. So the old covenant fulfilled in Abraham's death be made with the Hebrew people for generations. And the new covenant would be made a lot later. We can read about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Are we beginning to demand, commend ourselves again or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You, your, you yourselves are our letter of recommendation written in our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ for God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. The letter kills, but the Spirit gets life. Now, if the ministry of death, carved in letters of stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in the glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all. Because of the glory that surpasses it, for it was, for if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory, since we have such a hope. We are very bold, not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted. But only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, the veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is in the Spirit. This is the new covenant of God. And he, and he says that in Luke when he says, This is the new covenant of my blood. 